Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Mary, and I am an alcoholic, and I'm grateful to be here. Thank you for having me. I would like to thank Anne and the committee for inviting me. Um, You know, I have Ralph and Bob and Bob and Don and and Dick and Polly. What better company? It is such a, what a wonderful talk. They've been given such wonderful talks, haven't they? And it just touched my heart, and it's what I needed to hear. And uh, I would like to thank um, Laura for picking me up at the airport uh, and driving all this way. And she had her husband. Um, he he works in the fire department, and she had him appropriately in the back seat. <laughs> and they toured the Capitol with us and showed me all the things I normally only see on television. And he was telling me how they organized this, because when... America was separating from the UK. <laughs> I'm from the UK, by the way. <laughs> and I thought, and it was very interesting to me. I, I'm, I'm from Canada by default. God sent me there as punishment for my sin. <laughs> But I am very grateful to Canada because it is there that I found Alcoholics Anonymous. And I would like to thank Lee for inviting me. Thank you, Lee. This is wonderful. And, uh, and, and to see some old friends and meet some new friends is just really a treat. And uh, I am here to talk about Steps 8 and 9, which essentially deal with, for me, uh, forgiveness and courage. Step 8 is forgiveness and eight, to have the courage to do it. The seven-step prayer, my creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. To me, steps eight and nine are the answer to the seven-step prayer. It is, you see, relationships have been my biggest problem. I was talking to a dear friend of mine who's 35 years sober, and she, I love her very much because she's, she's one of the few ones who has the courage to tell me the truth, <laughs> apart from my sponsor. And I was saying to her about five years ago, you know, I go away and I do all this, and I spend a lot of time in AA. AA is my life. I don't have much of a, a life outside of Alcoholics Anonymous, and yet... You know, also, I still find it difficult to to, to talk, to have a conversation. She said, because you're socially inept and you're an introvert. (laughs) I said, really? (laughs) When I was nine years sober, almost ten, My husband, John, had a stroke, and it was such a bad stroke that he couldn't communicate. And in order to take him home to live with me, instead of keep him institutionalized forever, I had to put him in a behavioral center. And the behavioral center asked me if I would answer some psychological questions. Don't ever answer psychological (laughs) questions. They asked me if I would answer these psychological questions on relationship as regards my husband. They said, how often have you been married? Well, I didn't really, I had to be honest. I said, this is my fourth. And um, it's not my fault he's like this, you know. It's, uh, <laughs> so, and the others are still alive, you know, because I see them, you know. I'm dealing with psychiatrists here, and they're looking at me strangely anyway, but then that's the story of my life. And I'm so they, they, they say, you can take these little booklets home. They're basically so we get to know the relationship you and your husband had. And you're an alcoholic, he's an alcoholic. Maybe it would give us some understanding of the psyche of the alcoholic. So I took home these little booklets, and I filled them out, and I took them back. And three days later, I had a meeting arranged with them. 
So there was three psychiatrists. And um, they're sitting at a table. Now, bear in mind, I'm nine, ten years sober, uh, red hot AA. And uh, when I go there, they have a tape recorder. They said, we'd just like to record this. And I said, well, I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. But They said, anyway, we've, we've gone through all these questions and answers, and we'd like to know um, who's looking after you now. I said to them, I haven't been in a, an institute, a mental institute, for over 10 years. <laughs> I ha they said, what medication are you on? I said, I'm, I haven't, by the grace of God, I haven't been on medication for nearly 10 years. Over ten, since I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I have not taken medication. They said, well, this doesn't look good. <laughs> And I, and I said to them, well, all I can tell you is that I suffer from an illness called alcoholism. And, um, it, you know, it says that we're, we're not quite the same. I don't think I should be judged the same as normal people. And they disagreed with that. They wanted... <laughs> so anyway, with relationships, you know, in, in um, page... Where is it? This, 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 this has been a thing that I just... When I read it, you know... It says in our big book that um, defective relations with others, you know, defective relations with others. And I love the 12 and 12 as well. And then there it says, but it is from our twisted relations with family, friends, and society at large that many of us have suffered the most. The primary fact that we fail to recognize is our total inability to form a true partnership with another human being. That has been me since I was born. I have always had trouble with relationships. And I don't know why that is. It has never been easy for me. I think some of it was to do... Uh, you know, Bob Marley, I, I, I say it in my talk, and I'll say it again, when I saw him in that gas station, he said to me, you're a narcissist and a hedonist, and you don't care about nobody but yourself. And that is absolutely true. I realize in retrospect that that was absolutely true. What, what better explanation could I have for who I was? Also, my grandfather, who loved me more than anybody, he loved me unconditionally. He used to call me the young Catherine from Wuthering Heights. You know, that's who he thought I was. And I thought that was, you know, that's the kindest thing anybody could say until I read a psychological treatise on the narcissism of the young Catherine and what. <laughs> so I, I absolutely know who I am. Um, so steps eight and nine are concerned with relationships. When I was watching the tsunami the other day, the images of the tsunami, I had two feelings that were devastating to me. Like, remember when? And it was to do with relationships. One of them was when I looked at the chaos that surrounded Japan, and it was in Japan. And I thought, that can never be fixed. It is unfixable. That is a chaos from which there will never be any order. And I thought, oh my God. That is the same feeling I had when I came in. I came into Alcoholics Anonymous from Skid Row. Where I had devastated everything. Everything. I was the tsunami. I was the black sludge you saw coming down there with all these souls and things I had loved in my wit. And I had left them all through this obsession with self. And it took me right back to that time. And then I got down on my knees and I said, Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for giving me away because even if I don't do it right, I try to do it right all the time. And I suffer when I don't do it right because I want to be better than I ever was. Um, 
Oblivion and death, prior to my coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, were all I wanted. I did not want consciousness, and I had taken myself outside of society. I was no longer a part of society. And the depravity I was suffering was of my own doing. I had a great trouble with male men when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous and women. I mean, I hated everybody, but (laughs) I had a great trouble with men for the simple reason that where I was coming from, without going into any detail, um, had, 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 had been um, uh, uh, situations where I, I had no power as a woman. I was powerless as a woman. And um, I thought, that's unhealable. I thought I was so dirty that I could never again walk in the sunlight. Then I thought about my children. And my children that I had dragged around for a while before their father took them away from me, and rightly so. Who, when they were living with me in a foreign country, had seen me bring people home I shouldn't have brought home. And when they would say to me, Mommy, who was that man I saw last night? I say, you were dreaming. I made my sons question their reality. And what a dreadful thing that is to do. Then my parents, my parents were both dead when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I thought about what I had done to my parents. I thought about my father getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning. In the real dark night of the soul, it's always 3 o'clock in the morning. But getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning and saying to my mother, I don't know where my lassie is. I don't know where my grandchildren are, because they didn't know what happened to me. I went for a walk and dropped dead in the street. At the same time, I was living on the street. I thought about my mother, who had ovarian cancer. And I would call her drunk at two and three o'clock in the morning, not knowing she had only three more months left to live. I thought about my brother. When I went to my mother's funeral and was so drunk I almost dropped in the grave. How can you heal these things? You can't. So when I looked at step eight, and I had been reading Carl Jung, And Carl Jung said once, until the soul gets what it needs, it will get sick again. And I know that they had said that this is a soul sickness. The old timer said this is a soul sickness. And my soul was sick. My soul was dark. You see, I had taken myself away from God. And I thought that the depravity I was living in was that I had said, Why me, God? And God said, because you kicked me off. (laughs) And that was how I felt. And I felt I deserved it. And I believed in my innermost self that I was irredeemable. Because how can you fix all these things? I haven't gone into the husbands and all the rest of it, but these were uppermost in my mind when I came in here. So, how do I set about this forgiveness thing? I, I have to forgive. Now, I don't know the transformative moment. It was a transformative moment bred of despair. When I had the mea culpa feeling. The mea culpa that it is not anybody's fault but mine. It is my fault. And I want to forgive anything I ever thought anybody did and and seek forgiveness. And if I can't get forgiveness, I want understanding. And if I can't get understanding, I want everyone to know that I am truly set to do anything I can, as long as I live now, to become a better force 
even if they want nothing to do with me. And I said about that. I, I said about doing that. No. It said, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. And that means going back all the way. That just doesn't mean when I started drinking. That means going back all the way. And I had to realize that I always had a problem. Dr. Silkworth in the big book says that um, they realized that alcoholics needed some type of moral psychology, but they didn't know how to apply it. I was immoral from the get-go. I started stealing when I was... Now, let me tell you, I come from a wonderful Roman Catholic background. It could have been any religion, but they were good people. They wouldn't take anything. They wouldn't steal. They wouldn't tell a lie. They were good, living people. And all I was ever taught was about the good, right way to live. And I knew not how to do that. Or e either that or I said to myself, I will not do that. So from a very early age, I started stealing and lying and getting into a lot of trouble. I was fired from my, oh, I was kicked out of the convent because I didn't get on with the nuns or anybody else. I was, um, I, my first job, I got kicked out of there for cooking the books. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it was just a life of petty crime indulgence. You know, I, I, I seem to have this feeling that if you, if you have it and I want it, I'll take it. Thank you very much. And you can live without it. And I don't know where that came from. Of course, it is a sense of entitlement. It is a sense of being apart from and different so that I don't play by those rules. But when you do these things, they gradually build up until you cannot bear yourself anymore. And that's what happened to me. So I put down on my list, first of all, my parents. How can I make amends to my parents? Well, it, what I did was I sat down and I made the list. Because to me, the eighth step is a two-part list. Because if I've done the seven steps properly, by the time I get to the eighth step, I have a different perspective to when I started out. And I'm going to make a list of all the persons I had harmed, and in making that list, the second part is, I'm going to become willing to make amends. And I put out this list and I put my parents on top. And then I put my brother, my darling brother, my only sibling, whom I love and who has never been anything but good. He's one of those boys. He's a gold-haired, blue-eyed, upper performer with the government, working with the UK government, everybody just loves him. And I used to just hate him. <laughs> In fact, we were to I, I go and see him every year in Scotland, and we were talking on the phone a couple, of, a couple of weeks ago, and he said, you know, I discovered I'm, I'm suffering serious claustrophobia it's from the time you shut me up in the oven with them. Um, <laughs> I said, I don't remember that, but I do. <laughs> I said, I could get rid of my competition, but... <laughs> and um, my brother. And, uh, and, 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 and I did it. I did, I did the first part was uh, before I got married, because that was a whole different ball game. So I put down all the companies and everything and went right back, as far as I could remember. And then I got into the stuff that started with the marriage. And uh, then I got into my alcoholism. And what I saw in writing down the list of, of, of all people I had harmed is that every one of them had wanted me to be better or different than I was. And I had refused to do that. I had refused to change. You see, my personality was such that I will go with you for a little while 
and then I will get fed up or tired, and then I will decide to do what I want to do to change my situation, whatever that takes. But in putting down my husbands, I had four. And um, it was, um, I realized that those marriages, two of them I was not conscious. <laughs> And I really mean that. I was seriously under waters, as they say. Very drunk. One of them was before I drank, which is where my two children come from. And the other one was the marriage that I made in, um, in sobriety. And in putting down these, I did a little column. Because even though I had my fifth step list, I wanted a column for step eight, in which, what ways had I harmed these individuals? How did I harm them? I suffer from an illness that is mental, physical, and spiritual. So I must have hurt these people, spiritually, mentally, and physically. Physically, most certainly. The husbands, um... They've got scars today from my physicality and um, the children mentally and physically, not physically because I never actually, I put them in harm's way but I never actually abused them. So in, in putting down this list I looked at it and I, I thought to myself, how could you ever think that, it, that you were a victim? How could you ever truly believe that you were a victim. This is something that has been with you all your life. And if Alcoholics Anonymous is promising you as appendix to in the big book, a change of personality, then you go look at this and you go out to everybody you can to make these amends. The other thing I did was I talked to God. I said, God, I don't know how you can forgive me for all the things I've done. But you must forgive me. Otherwise you would not have given me the redemptive program and way of Alcoholics Anonymous because I should have been dead long ago. So God, if you forgive me, then it means I am worth something because I did not think I was worth anything whatsoever. The eighth step to me is a step that if someone had come to me and said, I have a gift. I have a gift that will take you from one place and put you to another of joy. I would have said, there is no gift. I am beyond anything. And they say, there's a step, a simple step. And in writing this step, you will begin to see that the things that happen when you put yourself in God's hands are better than anything you could have planned. And that there will be a way to heal your soul. And I thought for a while, why is my soul sick? Why is my soul sick? I thought back again to when I was young. And it doesn't really matter. I have no idea. If you, are, if you said to me, what was the most terrible thing that ever happened to you as a child? I would say my grandfather dying because he loved me unconditionally. I could not do without him. That's, that's the worst thing that happened. Did I start acting out yet then? Yes, I did. I started to act out then. But there was more than that. And I don't know what it is. You know, if I am born, as it says, some of us are born that way, and I just could never be honest or never be straight and always wanted to be different, I had an ego, inflated ego and low self-esteem. I certainly had that. And I certainly believed I deserved a special place in the universe. And I was totally uncaring of, oh, every now and then I might have a little bit of conscience about what I've done to you, but it wouldn't last very long. It never lasts very long, because the important thing is I'm okay, you know. 
So now I'm going to get into do step nine. Step nine, I needed a lot of courage to do that step. Because it was an utter and complete reversal I was taking now from the type of person I had portrayed to everyone. And with my children, the way I did step nine, because I had to put my son, my eldest son, on step eight, as well as my, my youngest. But you see, my eldest son had gone without telling me and written a letter to his father in Jamaica and said, when we land back in Jamaica, I don't want to be with mommy anymore, but don't tell her, because mommy is a drunk. And without knowing it, in doing that list, I saw that I had a resentment against my eldest son, who at 11 had to make the horrendous choice between his father and me. I never thought how terrible that was for my boy. I thought about what it did to me. So I had to go to that little boy and sit down and say to him, you know, son, you did the best thing for you and your brother. And also I had to go over everything I had ever done in their lives as a drunk and say, I am open, anything you want to know. With my um, parents being dead, how did I make amends to them? Well, the first thing I did was I sat down and I wrote two letters. One to my mom and one to my dad. Who both died early, I believe, because of me. Because of what I put them through as an only daughter. From when I was young to being a hopeless punk And disappearing from their, their lives. And taking their little grandchildren out of their lives. The only grandchildren they had. So I sat down and I, I wrote letters to mom and dad. And in those letters, I put down everything I had ever done to hurt them. And I posted them off to Scotland. And I put to Mr. Gallagher, care of the angels, Glasgow, Scotland. And Mrs. Gallagher, care of the angels, Glasgow, Scotland. And as I say, I can imagine a postman seeing another alcoholic making amends. <laughs> To my husbands, to the first one, who was in Jamaica, he took my kids away and rightly so. Thank God he did that. I, I might have killed them driving drunk or whatever. And I went to him and I knew it didn't matter what he had done. It was all about what I had done. And, um, you know, I, I told him I was, uh, I was sorry for my infidelities while we were married. I told him that I was sorry. I hit him over the head with a piece of mahogany. <laughs> <laughs> I told him I was sorry that I had embarrassed him in the society that we lived in. And that I, his parents, what I had done to them, I was sorry for being the person I... Because, you know, when we got married, he had hopes and dreams. He did not know that he was marrying something that had no sense of self. He did not know that he was marrying a figment of my imagination. <laughs> <laughs> because I was a figment of my imagination. You know, just like Bob said, I was a figment of whatever I had created and thought I was. To my second husband, who married me because, well, he didn't know it, but it was my ticket to Canada, um, I, I had to say to him, I'm so sorry that, you know, I married you. He said, why did you? I said, well, I was a hopeless drunk when you married me. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> That's not a very nice thing to say to him. But he knew I drank too much. But I told him it was totally irresponsible of me and whatever happened, I'm sorry that I ruined your life because that only lasted two years. And for the third husband, again, I got married and didn't know what I was doing. It was all about self. It was all about me. And I had to make amends to him too. In the making of the amends, 
to the rest of my extended family and my brother. By the time I was making amends to my brother, um, the damage that had been done to him through my behavior as an only sibling was much more than I had realized. Hearts are broken, sweet relationships are dead. And I sat with my brother for a long time and let him talk to me about everything that had gone on in the family that I hadn't been a part of and that he had been present for. And by the grace of God in Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the amends I was able to make to my brother was that uh, when I was about six years sober, he had a, a child born, a little boy, Richard, who's now 20, to almost 20, 21. And um, Richard was born without arms and a club foot. And I was able to go to Scotland because my brother became um, inert, I would say with grief and I was able to go to Scotland and I uh, stayed with him for a while his wife was beyond help for me her sister was with her and I took my brother and baby Richard and I drove all around the highlands in Scotland and it was summer and I took off Richard's little coat so that people could see he didn't have any heart arms and he was beautiful and people were coming up and saying, what a beautiful child. And I said to my brother, see, you don't have to hide him away or hide you away. I said, and I'll be here for you. And I said, I'll even take Richard and look after him until you're ready to do that. The other man that was really, really important to me was my, my aunt. My aunt had come and they are the ones who came and took me off Skid Row in Florida. And they're very good Catholic women. And they had said to me, if you ever have a get married again, we'll have nothing more to do with you. <laughs> and when I got married in sobriety, I wrote to them and said, well, have nothing more to do with me because I'm getting married again. And I realized that the, the, the tone that I had spoken to them with was unforgivable. So I, I've been able to, a couple of years ago, when they were still able to move around, they flew to Canada, and I drove them. They wanted to go all across the United States of America. They wanted to go from Toronto to British Columbia, but going through the United States. And I did that. And one of them was in a wheelchair, and it wasn't easy, but it was it was wonderful. Uh, and and I, I'm going to see them again this year and look after them for a couple of weeks. Making the amends for me has been healing and ongoing. I continually see where my behavior has affected people that are slowly brought back into my life again. I don't believe that I should wait to make amends. I keep a current tense. But I know that because of my propensity, you know, my grandfather, when he used to be coming off a, a drunk, he was a weekend drinker, but nice, nice with it. You know, he'd be sitting holding his head in his hands, and I'd say to him, what are you thinking about? He'd say, I'm pondering the immensities. <laughs> And I used to ponder the immensities until I almost disappeared into my navel, <laughs> thinking about things. And I know that is my potential today. Because, you see, I believe that if I become sensitive again, then it means that I am moving back into the old ways, where I have to protect my sensitivity by isolation. If I go to a meeting and talk to someone and say, hi, and they don't answer me, then I go home and I think about it. 
I'm not thinking about them, I'm thinking about me. And I'm thinking, where did they go Wednesday night? I'm going to go say hi again. <laughs> that is my potential. And inevitably, and you know, this was something Clancy gave me, um, inevitably, I will find out that that person who didn't say hi, something's wrong with them. Something terrible has happened in their life. And um, it's not going well. It's nothing to do with me. You see, it's not about me. The other day I had a problem, and it was to do with envy. And again, when one of these comes up in my life, then I want to shut off the relationship. Because that's been my way. You know, as me or the highway, if I don't get my way. And what happened here was to do with my little grandchildren and my son in Aruba, and I uh, was all caught up in family. They're selling their house in Toronto because they're going to be living in Aruba for the next five years. And they're going to de they decided to sell the house in Toronto, so they're going to be coming up and staying with her mother. Because her mother has a five-bedroom house. And I thought about that. And I began to feel quite sorry for myself. And I asked God why I don't have a five-bedroom house. <laughs> because if you were looking after me, God, I'd be able to put up my grandchildren, my son. and So then I got into envy. Envying my poor daughter-in-law's mother. Because I, I got into envy. And it, a couple of days I was in there. I was, I don't know if you, when you have a defect of character like me, I wake up in the morning, but it's already woken up and sitting by my bed. <laughs> <laughs> and it starts talking to me before I can get my eyes open. <laughs> and it's got an Irish accent, so it's relentless. <laughs> it's relentless. The language and uh, the retribution and um, the pity of it all. So I went to a step meeting and the insight I got from attending that step meeting was this. That every time I have one of these things that will once again separate me from my fellows or me from my relationships, I have to look at it deeply to see what is behind it. And I took this envy and I examined it closely. And I said, what is behind this envy? And behind this envy was fear. And what was the fear? The fear was that perhaps my grandchildren would love their granny or their granny more than me. That was the fear. Forgetting one more time to be grateful that I have such a wonderful relationship with my children. That I shouldn't even be in my children's life. You know, my son, Richard, the one who went and told his dad he didn't want to be with me anymore, he finally made up with his father and was down in Jamaica recently with his wife and grandchildren. And he said, Mom, Dad asked me a little bit about what it was like with you being drunk all the time when we were young. And he said, Daddy, sometimes I'd look in my mother's eyes and there was nobody there. There was absolutely nobody there. He said, and now I'm with my mother, and she's completely present to me and my children. And my mother has been steadfast in my life for 25 years. He said, Daddy, that is transformation. And he used the word. The only way I am able to do this consistently is by following the steps and doing what I am supposed to do. 
I was talking with some of the guys at lunchtime. I am working right now for a woman who God has put in my life to test just how I'm doing. (laughs) (laughs) With relationships. And it's just her and I in this office. And she has a temper. And she doesn't know me. She doesn't know anything about me. I've been with her three years. She doesn't like alcoholics. She doesn't like, she thinks there's no redemption for alcoholics. Um, she's had a couple work for her that have caused her no end of grief because we, we're a private health service. So they go and live in with these very rich clients. Some of them get drunk and kind of clear out the jewelry for a little while. And so she does not like alcoholism or alcoholics. So when she asked me about going away for these weekends, I say I'm going away for charity. <laughs> <laughs> my charity and um, which means I'm not always available but I only work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday so I don't want to be available so every now and then she'll, every now and then she'll act up and she'll try me and she'll say um, you know, I don't agree with what you're doing here and I'll say well that's how you said I wanted it done she said well if you could come in on Friday I said I'm going away Friday and she'll get upset and she may throw it down on the ground where she immediately wants me to take it up, wrap it around her face, (laughs) you know, and extinguish her. (laughs) And what I've been doing for almost three years is saying, you know what I'm, you know the terms of my employment, you know. Now, recently, it's become a bit much. And she's testing me to the nth degree. <laughs> so a couple of weeks ago, we had a slight altercation. <laughs> and I lost it. And I closed the door. I said, no. Let me tell you something. <laughs> And what happened is that old street survivor came out and petrified her. (laughs) And I was ashamed of myself. Ashamed. I cannot tell you the shame I felt. And I made amends to her. And now for the last two weeks she can get me to do most things by reminding me of what happened. So I've given her a tool to annihilate me. So, you know, I was talking to Polly this morning at breakfast and I was saying, you know, I don't know if I can work it. No, here's my pattern again. And I question myself with my newfound spiritual way of being. I say, okay, this has been your pattern all your life. You get in there, Things get the way you don't want them. They don't treat you right. Whatever. And you leave. Is that what you're doing now? And there's a place I call, in relationships and other things, the moment between trapezes. Do you know the moment between trapezes? In my sobriety, I have come to some a spiritual cul-de-sac sometimes. When I've said, okay, I cannot continue this way. So God will send me a solution. The moment between trapezes is when I let go of one and grab the other one. If it is there. Inevitably, God's hand has been there. In this relationship that I'm in right now, can I do that? Do I let go? and say, bye, it's been nice knowing you, and wait for God to present me with something else? Perhaps not. Perhaps this is another one of these tests that I will have to survive in this relationship the way I should have survived in some of those marital relationships. Maybe this is just a formation of character building. Maybe this is just character, because the whole thing for me is about character building. Getting rid of my old ways that come back when again I'm feeling sensitive. 
or whatever, um, is an ongoing process. And I'm so grateful to God that I have the years to do this thing. That I have the years to rebuild some of what I, w- I was... The last time I was in court, the police, uh, the, 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 the lawyer said I had suffered tragic social circumstances. That I was a victim of tragic social circumstances because I had convinced them all of that. The fact is, the world was the victim of tragic social circumstances, <laughs> which was me. <laughs> you know, I created this chaos and I have to fix it up again. When my husband John, I was able to take him out of the hospital and take him home. It is the best relationship I have ever had. He could never speak again and he couldn't understand the spoken word. He was childlike. And I realized that that was an amend God had given me to look after him. And I looked after him 24-7. And I never, ever, ever was unkind to John. It was great trying sometimes. But I saw him look at me, and although he couldn't speak, he would pat my face. And he could still hum, even although he only had one half of his brain left. And I looked at him and I thought, this is God enabling me to do for this man what I was never able to do for anything before. Now, we are the most fortunate people in the world. There is no road here from where I'm coming from to fix relationships. There's no road. And if I did not have these steps, it would be impossible for me to live with the knowledge of the things I had done. It would be impossible for me to live with the knowledge of where I had been and what I had seen. This is the best thing. This is... We don't even understand how huge this is. And the biggest thing that has been for me is that separation from God that put me into the dark side has been healed. Because I am only here by the grace of God. And wherever Bill and Bob were given so long ago that they gave to me, through the channel of all the people who have gone before me. And the people in Edmonton, Alberta, when I came through the doors, so broken and beaten, not in good shape. I remember saying to an old sponsor, my first sponsor, Carol, in Edmonton, Alberta, look at all these 13 steppers. They never 13 step me. <laughs> She said, do you remember what you looked like when you come in? <laughs> she said, you couldn't even walk. We used to take it to me as in a shopping cart. <laughs> so I was not in good shape. <laughs> so there is no road. And, and you know, I, I went back to Jamaica in sobriety. My sponsor, Rini, told me to go back and make amends to the island. <laughs> <laughs> It was not easy for me to go back to Jamaica because I had created chaos. It's a small island. And the society I was in was um, a very upper-class, snobbish society. And they had never seen anything like me. (laughs) Where I go to the country club and break a bottle and challenge someone to a duel. You know, you just, you just did not do that. <laughs> or else take up their piece of lalik and threaten to pulverize someone with it, you know. So, and I was going back, not with any wealth. I was going back there. I had a job, and I was going back to work as a sales rep. So it was very difficult, and I asked God for the courage. And I went back. I'll tell you my whole reason for going back. I went back. (laughs) I'll I'll give this little story and then I'll finish. 
when I still was able to pretend to have some sobriety or some way of behaving, not too drunk, a cricketing team came to Jamaica. And it must have been a particularly lucid moment for me. Um, this cricketer, who had been knighted by the Queen, asked me if I would come to this celebration up in the hills for all the visiting cricket team. I said I'd love to. He didn't know my history. He was a visitor. So he takes me up to this gorgeous mansion in the hills, and the fellow at the door was Sally, whom I knew. He was the host. And this cricketer who, sir, I'll just call him Sir Cricketer, <laughs> he said, uh, it's very nice of you, Sally, to have this do for the, the, the team. And you said we could bring someone, so I brought Mary. I don't know if you know, know Mary. And Sally said, know her? She's more famous than you, man. <laughs> So I went back to Jamaica with humility, and I decided that I was going to do what it took. I was going to stay there for two years. I got involved in AA in Jamaica, heavily involved, and um, worked with the poor people. I'm a published writer. I wrote some articles uh, for the newspaper and, uh, and just dwelt within the society, and the people who lived in the big mansions the people who lived in the big mansions had nothing more to do with me, except one very, very um, wealthy man. And he, he had a, a, a dinner for me, for those who would come. And he made a little speech. And he said, I always felt that Mary would get well, because cream always rises to the top. And that meant so much to me. And the important thing was that I went back and mended a legacy that my children's mother was not a hopeless drunk, that she was a respectable, working, loving mother. And that's what I did. The wounds are very deep in the children. They love me today very, very much. But every now and then I see the little thing. And two years ago, my son sent me a first-class ticket to go to Aruba for two weeks. And I had a wonderful two weeks in Aruba. Beautiful. And a couple of nights before I was going home, after a lovely day, my grandchildren were out playing outside. And I said to my, uh, my son, he was sitting with his back to me having supper. I said, Mark, don't you think we should bring in the children? It's getting dark outside. He said, where was I when I was seven, Mom? He was seven when he was taken away from me. And I realized it was right here still. I wanted to weep, but I didn't. I said, son, I'm so sorry. I don't know what to say to you. I'm so sorry. So, this is the best thing, the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous, the miracle of transformation. You see, I know that I have been recovered from a hopeless condition of mind and body, but I know that I have also been taken from the deep, dark night of the soul back into a life that provides me with light and God's love and being part of this wonderful fellowship. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.